Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, digital transformation in the manufacturing industry. And I know I'm day two. I know I'm not the first guy to go be up here and talk about this. So I'm just going to say, on the Mac review, I think that you saw this yesterday in one way or another. We are moving. This is happening. This is not a question. It's just a question of how fast is this going. You will all be affected. If you don't know who the Uber in your industry is, it's not you. So what I want to talk about is a little bit the changes that we see here in the, uh, the new world, the complexity. One thing that's always going to remain the same is the, uh, the need to, to have operational excellence. We will need to be better at what we're doing. We will need to do the things we did yesterday better than we did. Uh, or we need to do them better today than we did yesterday. But that's never going to be enough because we need to create new services. We all expect new things. We all expect things today that we didn't expect five years ago, ten years ago. Hand up anybody who actually makes their uh, banking business in real life. On the phone. Oh, wait, we have some old people here. That's good. <laughs> on the computer and on... Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, you're right. On the phone, I, th I think I misspoke. Who calls them and do banking business? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, we don't have them, that old people here. <laughs> We all do our banking business on the phone, but that's not calling people. We don't want to talk to people anymore. Same thing in the industry world, in the uh, industrial world. We expect things today and tomorrow that we didn't expect 10 years ago. We used to think just in time was your wishful thinking. We hope it will arrive just in time. We hope everything is as we expected. Today, we look at the app and we say, you're seven minutes late. Will you make up the time? It's a very different world. And of course, that also goes into the uh, responding to connected, uh, empowered co consumers. The consumers and also the uh, uh, customers in, in, in the industry, they are empowered in a way they haven't been before. So they know what's happening, and they expect to know. And that's also going to communication the entire value chain. We want to be able to communicate. We expect to be able to communicate, and we expect all of you guys to share your data. And that's another thing that, that's really changing now, and there's a really big macro trend towards sharing of data. I only know one company who can build up walls and become successful. And at least 70% of you guys probably have that company in your phone. And you see one over here now. <laughs> it's only Apple who can actually have that type of uh, situation and they are in the consumer space. No, none of you guys will be strong enough to build up walls and keep all your data internally and only work with your own data. And that's also something that's new. Of course, the regulations, the GDPR and everything, that's going to make it a lot more complex. It's a lot of more uh, issues to, to handle there, but we're confident that we, we're on the right track. And the last one I want to bring up is the risks. It's, it says cyber risk. That's a great risk as well. But I want to bring up the image risk. An old example, but United Airlines. What pops into mind? Great service? Good boxing? Most of you guys have seen this doctor being beaten up in a United Airlines flight. It took, I think I saw it 17 hours after it happened, and I was late. If I go back, Let's go back 10, 15 years. Nobody would have cared. It wouldn't even have been a notice in, in a small newspaper anywhere. Today, you would be affected by risks that you didn't, you didn't know existed a few years ago. You need to be able to meet the press, the uh, non-press, and the, the normal consumer, and the normal uh, public confidently with the right information and act accordingly regardless of your business. And that's kind of new. And when I started my career, I was very much in this motion, a linear uh, world. And this is not that long ago. It's, it's the beginning of the century. Uh, and that's not the 19th, it's the 20th century. Or 21st, sorry, it's in English, it's the 21st century. <laughs> Everything was linear. Microsoft was linear. We spent two or three years in the basement developing a new product, and then we shipped it to you and said, here's the new office package. 
See you again in three years' time. Went back. Everything was linear, handed from, from person to person. That's not the way it is anymore. If your marketing department does a good job, your salespeople will sell more. If the salespeople sell more, the production needs to produce more. If they produce more, the suppliers need to, to supply more. And if they supply more, the logistics company needs to transport more. If everybody in the, the value chain is not aware of this, you will have problems. So of course, what we're do, doing now is we're actually connecting the physical and the digital into what we call a system of intelligence. And this system of intelligence is, is fairly simple in theory, but very difficult in practice. Because all of this is actually con consists of, of players that you don't control. So you need to be much more um, working together with others. You need to have much more information interchange. So this is the, the, the change that we're going through. And I think that the, the big shift here in the world is from the old world to the new world. In the old world, you didn't have enough information. I remember growing up, being a child, we had 15 different books, like an encyclope encyclopedia of something. And if you were lucky, you could find information that was semi-outdated. Now, my eight-year-old will school me on things she finds on the internet. And there's too much information. You have to make sure what to take out. 99.999% of all information, you have to get rid of it. You just need to know what to get rid of. And the hierarchies, the static hierarchies, and one of my favorite things here is, of course, when I was a kid, I called my first girlfriend. Of course, I didn't call her, I called her house. Her dad answers. That's a static hierarchy, you have to work your way through it. That, that's gone. <laughs> Again, my eight-year-old has a phone. The, the, the hierarchies are totally changing. The same thing in the companies. And the communication ways are not being controlled anyway, you ha uh, any, anymore. You have to know how to, how to work in that world. And the productivity. You used to optimize every piece of this value chain because you couldn't, do, you couldn't see the rest of it. And now you have to do a full optimization of the collective, uh, collective value creation. And well, I, this I, didn't even, I don't even understand this. This is morally towards the, the consumer side. They are now brand ambassadors. I have no clue what they are, but they, they get paid a lot of money for showing off things on Instagram. I hate them. But in the real world, <laughs> even our uh, industrial customers are our brand ambassadors. We need to make sure they have an op opportunity to, to be that and feel that and love our product and listen to them when they speak to us. So we need to have a two-way communication to make sure they can actually speak with us. And then, of course, we used to plan ahead, make strategic plans for three or five years. Doesn't work anymore. We have to be agile and respond to changes. One way Microsoft is doing this is, of course, we are we are seeing the need to be more open. If you look at Microsoft, again, 10, 15 years ago, we were more monolithic and my way or the highway type of thing. But now what we're doing is we're partnering with agile uh, partners who can work with us to enhance the offering. We enhance their offering, they enhance our ability to serve our customers. And we talked and we're working together on Azure and Dynamics 365 to make sure we can bring you guys a better experience. And the other ways we changed, we used to make products. And I think this goes for ba basically all of, of the Swedish manufacturing industry. We used to make products, see you, and now we need to provide services. Most of my Swedish customers I work with, with basically all the manufacturing and industries in Sweden, we're going to find some way of, of providing as a service. If they're not, they're not going to be successful. So I'm trying to convince them all that they need to do this. That means we had to change our business model from selling a product or a license in, in our way, in our uh, world, to providing a subscription, making sure you pay continuously because you're liking the things we're giving you. Because if you don't, you just stop it. 
It also meant we have to change our internal operations, and that, that's, that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my presentation talking about. But one of the things that this also meant for us was we had to change our entire engineering organizations. We used to have engineering that focused on minimizing the mean time between failures. Make sure you ship it and hope it, it doesn't break down that often. To mean, to we have to focus now on mean time to recover or repair or resolve. Make sure that when it breaks, when something goes wrong, it kicks up immediately. This is the same thing that's changing in, in the minds of all industrial companies I work with. You cannot ship a product and hope it works. You have to ship a product and know it works, or at least know how to, to solve it when it breaks down. So, you might not know Microsoft as a production company, but I think that, uh, I lo looked at the numbers a few uh, weeks ago, we spent eight billion dollars in our production and in cost. I don't think there's more than three companies in Sweden that spend more. We spend eight billion dollars in producing 77 million things. Oh, sorry, I missed this one. <laughs> 77 million things. 42,000 42, uh, stock kept units, so different types of, of uh, things. We have 390 suppliers, which is not that much, but we ship to 30,000 locations in 107 countries. So, from an operational perspective, we know production, we know logistics. We know supply chain. But we also knew that we had an issue in, in, in how to run this in a new uh, way, so to speak, in the, in the, the, the way that we needed in uh, 2018. So what we did is we decided we need to transform. And the reasons are quite simple. The same thing that each and every one uh, in the manufacturing industry feels. It's a constant pricing and margin pressure. The service expectation goes up. So basically, I expect you to give me next day delivery. I get that from Amazon. Why can't I get my gearbox next day? I get my milk next day, or even the same day. Of course, the, the virtualized and distributed supply chain, we have no control over all the parts of our supply chain. We need to work in a better way to make sure we can control and uh, work with them and optimize it. And in our case, product life cycles are down to months. Most of my industrial uh, customers will tell me, it's not decades anymore, it's years. Which also means that you don't have time to spend years in product development. You need to come out with a product to your customer much faster. So what do we do? The funny thing is, I work for a company, we sell PowerPoint and Excel. The first thing we did was we banned PowerPoint and Excel. Because our COO, uh, in charge of all uh, production and manufacturing and supply chain in Microsoft said, the problem is, every time somebody brings me a PowerPoint and Excel sheet, we're sitting around this table every Friday morning or Monday morning, the first thing somebody says is, that number is wrong. Did you use the right FX number? Oh, I've updated the uh, uh, supply information here. Oh, that information is old. And they spent at least half the meeting discussing who, we, oh, if the data was right or not. So he said, I don't want PowerPoint or Excel. I want to have real-time information. So what he did is he said, don't come to me with your own reports. Don't come to me with your own uh, wait, wait, you can come to me with your own reports, but don't come to me with your own data. So what we did is we, got, we made sure we got connected and basically put a one version of the truth in place. We made sure we had agreement on what data do we use. If that data is wrong, it's wrong for all of us, and we work together to fix that data. We make sure we have agreement on this is the data that we actually work with. And then if you want to make reports on that, fine. But then you make it so we can actually all see the source data. We use a different tool, the Power BI tool, which is fantastic, 
We can talk about that later. But it doesn't really matter because the important thing is that we had one version of the, of the, the truth. And when we had that, we started to be able to, to make predictions on that data. Started to understand that, oh wait, it seems that when the uh, temperature is above eight X and the humidity is above Y, our glue in the HoloLens production doesn't work. That insight by itself saved us, uh, I think it was 80% of the scrap went out by knowing this information. And then we started getting cognitive, started being smarter about what type of decisions do, do the, uh, the person need to make and what can the machine make themselves. They tell me that 90% of all decisions now are made by machines. I'm guessing it's uh, speed and the feed type of decisions. But still, they've taken away a load of uh, manual work from the operators and the plant managers. So now the plant managers are running the, the business from a dashboard. It took six guys six weeks to bring up the first 12 dashboards. But then over the course of 12 months, roughly, the smart organization started making new charts. Because if I'm the, the ma manager of this operation, I say, this is what I want to see. That means you need to make your charts or your presentation to feed mine, which means you have to feed his. And then all the smart people in the organization started realizing you're looking for the wrong things. And start, so it became an oscillating effect. It is never going to stop oscillating. In the beginning, it was big changes, and then smaller and smaller. But constantly, we changed so that the culture in the company became a culture of sharing information, showing information, making sure that everybody's aware of what's happening. Basically saying, I have a problem. Could you help me with your, your insights? And the real kicker is, we did this in China. If you worked in China, you know that the culture in China is not a culture of showing your problems and your mistakes. We made the culture change by going after the data. We made sure that everybody understood that it's not my data, it's our data. It's not my problem, it's our problem. Because the value chain is inter integrated. So now we have a factory in China that runs a full transparent process of showing your data. And I said it took six guys six weeks to make this the first version of it. The technology is so easy. The only, prob the only problem we've had with this is the culture. How do you change people, people's ways and behaviors? People have been uh, you know, experts in the, in the field for 30 years. People who know their job. How do you make them show, show this off? And of course, it starts from the top. It really starts with making sure you have one version of the truth, making sure you really uh, pressure people to, to actually deliver on this and showcase the data. A lot of hard work. But the biggest, biggest obstacle I see when I talk to uh, my, my customers or my, my, uh, my strategic partners, is they say, we're never going to make it. It's so big. I know it's so big. That's why we have to start small. We don't have to, to uh, solve everything. If we can make this part of the value chain 5% better, that's 5% better than you had yesterday. The next day we can take this one and make it 10% better. And then we can combine it and make them both 20% better. And then we can take 5% over here. And over the next eternity, <laughs> we will be perfect. But at least we have to start. But when we start small, we really need to make sure that we think big. Because one of the biggest problems is that we do proof of concepts, or POCs, and we do them in isolation. I say, hey, this works. And one of my customers, they have 27 different POCs. All showed that the proof of con the concept works. None of, them, none of them scales, and none of them actually is, is integratable with any of the others. Totally useless. Because they, they started thinking small, which is great. But if you don't have your, your mind on the, uh, or your, your eye on the end game, the, the big picture, you're never going to be able to scale it. So you have to make sure that even if you're a small company today, if you're going to win the world, think that you're going to win the world, and make sure you're, you're taking decisions that actually allow you to, to scale infinitely. But of course, that's not the most important thing. 
the most important thing is run fast. Fail fast, learn fast, try again. This is very difficult in, in Swedish uh, manufacturing. Swedish manufacturing, they want to make it perfect and then test it five times before they ship it. Tesla didn't. Tesla made a car that's okay, and they, they are continuously updating it every night. The, that mindset, starting not small in Tesla's case, but starting with the mindset of, of thinking big and then running fast and changing it constantly, needs to come into the Swedish engineering. And I don't mean ship sub-par uh, products, but change the way you think about engineering and change the way you think about what, what do you, how do you trade off the uh, time to market with the, the, the perfection of engineering. Because if you come out with a perfect product late, you don't have a perfect product. You don't have a product because nobody would buy it. If you come out with a product that, is, that meets the requirements and you can continuously improve it, that's how you win. So for us, I think that the, the, the key takeaway here is that if you're date or every every company uh, in in manufacturing are data rich, there's oh, petabytes of data in most companies. There's data everywhere. The data is is just an abundance. We have so much information we don't know what to do with it. We used to in in Microsoft production we we used to actually have we used to collect a billion data points per day. We were able to anal analyze less than 1% of that. Now we are collecting 10 billion data points per day. We're throwing most of it away, because most of it is, is useless. But we are able to analyze 100% of it. So just having data is not really going to help you, because most of it will be in repositories in different places that are not connected to each other. Most of it will be untrusted. Most of it will be in, in, in a format that you can't access. I'm pretty sure most of you still have manual input in, on paper at, in some process in somewhere in your company. How do, you, how do you go from having that into creating this trusted, you know, correct data, credible data that conveys the right message? You need to make sure you get that position. Because you can't have a multitude of, uh, of truths. You can't have fighting over who's, who has the right number. You have to make sure that there is one version of the truth. And that doesn't mean that every single information that you, you collect has to be microsecond. I'm perfectly fine with saying real time is every January the 3rd, the uh, FX rate for the year is set. Fine. And it's set by, by Carolyn. Perfect. Then it's set by Carolyn, and it's, it's real time because we know it's set at this point, then, it, then it, that's the truth. And they have a machine that spits out microsecond data, or millisecond data, whatever it is, doesn't really matter. And that's real-time data as well. But we have a rule that says, this is the source of the data. This data we trust, this data we, we, we work with. That's a, the foundation. And then you have to be a little bit more intelligent with it as well. When I, joined, when I started my, my career, I was told, don't try to boil the ocean. Make an hypothesis and prove it. You will never be able to do all the calculations. Now it's like, what do you mean? If I use my phone, I have more access to more data than NASA, or more compute power than NASA. None of you have, an, have a lack of compute power. What you usually have a lack of is a business case. But if you have the data, you have to make sure that you, you, you use the data to make, make it intelligent. And let the data actually give you a uh, hypothesis or a number of hypotheses, enhance your own decision making. And one of the, the, the last points here, the collaboration thing. 
We have to make, create a culture that allows you to, to collaborate. Anybody ever seen the, the forecast process in a large corporation? It starts with me making up a bullshit number, handing it to somebody else, who says, yeah, that's bullshit. I'm going to add 25%. Uh, Next person says, oh, I know, I know they're always lying. I'll take out 50%. And then it ends up in the hands of the CFO. And I've seen this happen. They throw it out and say, I just take last uh, year's numbers and I adjust them by whatever feels right. This happens in successful Swedish companies. <laughs> I know it happens in unsuccessful Swedish companies as well. <laughs> and it happens in, in international companies as well. But this is a problem because the, the collaboration and the culture is not there. So I think that, that's my, I would say that that's my final message to you guys is that you need to create a new culture. A new culture where, where, where actually the, the collaboration and the sharing of information is key. And the uh, trust and the agreement that this is the truth. Because if you have that, you have currency. If you have currency, you can make smart decisions and remain successful. If you don't have information and a culture of, of creating valuable information, you will have a problem. But you guys understand this, so I, I'm guessing that you will have the currency and make smart decisions and remain successful. I'm going to leave you guys here and say thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, if there's any questions, I know that uh, some of them will be answered in two sessions this afternoon. There's a session on Dynamics 365, which uh, I know our friends from Bosch, uh, Robert Bosch Engineering will hold. And there's a se session on cloud that my uh, colleague Marcus will hold. They actually go in parallel, but there's two of them, so you can actually join both of them and listen and understand how Microsoft Cloud will help you do this and how Dynamics 365 together with Tacton can help you do these, these things as well. So thank you very much for uh, taking time to listen to me. Thank you. thank you very much. No, I'm, I'm not going to let you leave just, oh. just yet uh, because we're making really good time. Mm. Uh, so we have a few minutes. Oh, perfect. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more to you about this thing with the behavior in the mm. organizations. Uh, because, I mean, it seems like there needs to be a, a change in behavior. So what would you, would you say is, is necessary? Like, what is the necessity to actually get this change going? It, it has to start from the top. And it has to be uh, a, a true change. In our case, it was our COO. He basically said, you know what? I'm not comfortable with the way we run uh, my business. I need a change. And, and the problem is, you can't just say this. You have to live it. Mm -hmm. And one of my, my, my perfect examples is that I've been in so many companies where we, we talk about how sales should be done. And then we celebrate something else. And the, the example here is that if, if you celebrate the person who beats his forecast the most, then you're celebrating the wrong thing. Because that there's a budget, there's always a budget, and the budgets can be set wherever everybody is. But people who, who, who um, uh, sandbag their uh, forecast to keep the expectations down and then over deliver, that creates the, the culture of, of keeping things to myself and, and trying to, to surprise my organization, which creates an enormous problem for the uh, production. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that the best salesperson it's not the person who beats the forecast the most. It's the person who actually makes the best forecast above budget and meets it. <laughs> and that's understanding that if you make a forecast of 100 and you get 97, that's much better than if you get 115 mm. if the, uh, uh, the budget is, is below, so mm. to speak. But having the forecast means that you can actually change the culture. Mm. And we did that very well in, in Microsoft as well. We started changing. Uh, how we um, celebrate the best salespeople. Okay. That's, so that's, that's number, not number one. It's not a one decision. It's no. a <laughs> cultural change, and it yeah. takes time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.